That's good. Who else has a praise? Yeah, Tim. I walked as a young man in darkness. I mean, the Bible says men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And as of late, Peter mentioned that mercy, man. I'm so glad that God had mercy on me. He said, mercy rejoiceth against judgment. And when you're a young man and you're wicked and you're vile and you do wicked and vile things and you have to come to that realization that that's what you wanted above God. Mm. But man, God helped me and God brought me to a place so low where I realized that's what I wanted more than him. Man, and God saved me and now I can read my Bible and I can see truth in that and I'm thankful for that word and I'm thankful that he brought me to a place where I'm in mercy with that's him. That's good. It's a wonderful thing and that's I'm just good. starting to understand that. Yep. Amen. Amen. That's good. Yep. I'm thankful that in his justice he showed mercy. That's right. Mm, yeah. He is just in showing mercy. That's something that'll... That'll blow your carnal mind. Sir, I want to thank God that he is eternal in the time that there's no consequence to him. Yeah. That I can look back so far in the past in my life to him dealing with me, the lost person. Yeah. And to him that was all present. Mm -hmm. And I want to show, I want to, I want to praise God for, uh, for hope. Uh, mm -hmm. He showed me that uh, uh, what a wonderful thing it is to be able to share hope with people. I praise him for the ability to do that. And that is, I'll do obviously, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ is the host. That That's right. Share. Amen. And, uh, he's worthy of that. That's good. Amen. For that, that uh, joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Uh, he went to that cross, and it, it says in Psalm 16 that his flesh shall rest in hope. His flesh was resting in hope. And it was resting, awaiting for that resurrection. His soul was made a, an offering, a burnt offering for sin in the flames of hell. And, and he was resurrected out of that. And, uh, but that flesh was resting in hope. And he went to that cross knowing that. But for the joy that was set before him, and I've heard it preached and taught, and, and, and I'm okay with it, that you know he's looking forward to the kingdom, looking forward to his reign, looking forward to the glory that was to come. But I, I've got to believe that joy that's set before him was when he looked at me and he saw him break me and then he saw him himself heal up my wounds and mollify me with ointment and, and the salvation being wrought of God, that he saw my face as he was walking towards Calvary. Oh, what a good God. Bless his holy name. And that's, just, that's, not, just, that's not just preaching talk. That's... Bless his holy name. Amen. That's good. All right. 1 Corinthians 6. <clears throat> We're going to start right in verse 9. Uh, before we begin, Brother John, do you want to ask the Lord to bless our time of preaching? Father, I do the your name. And I want to thank you um, beforehand, Father, uh, for the assembly right now at this time with you. Um, I praise you for these men and thank you for uh, these brethren and also friends uh, that we can have this time right now. I ask, Father, that you would uh, meet with us and uh, that your spirit would move and the Holy Ghost would use the, the tongue of the pastor to give to us what you would have for us. I thank you so much. And uh, Father, I am always better than what I deserve. And uh, I ask this in your most holy name, Jesus. Amen. All right, verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Amen and amen. And such were some of you, and such are some of you. But Paul says, and such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Such were some of you. John 15, if you go to John chapter 15, we're going to do a little flipping today, but I, I think that we can handle it. 
John 15 and verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. And by the way, that ETH, it is that continual tense of that verb. It's a continual purging. It isn't just that he purges you one time. He will continue to go back as that husbandman, and he will prune that vine, and he will prune it, and he will prune it, and he will purge it, and he will purge it. That ought to bring comfort to some of you. He purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Such were some of you, but now you are washed, now you are sanctified, now you are justified. Jesus said, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. We're going to be talking about uncleanness today. And that word unclean, we're going to look at it a little bit in Leviticus and see what it means and, and see how it applies. And we're going to spiritualize a couple of things. I try not to spiritualize too much. I like to preach doctrine because it's, it's what doctrine is what Peter or Paul was charging Timothy to preach. And doctrine is what divides. Okay? And that's a cry in the ecumenical world to get rid of doctrine because it divides. But I'm telling you what, Jesus Christ brought a sword. And a sword divides. That sword of the word of God is that sword that is sharper than any two-edged sword, and it pierces even the dividing asunder. It's not a hacking sword. It isn't a swiping blow. It is a piercing. It's accurate. And it divides asunder. Dividing asunder is completely separating. Okay? It's completely separating the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow. All right? It affects you in the entirety of your person. That is the word of God. And so as we look at this thing, he says, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches, and he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Go to Leviticus chapter 5. Uh, this idea of uncleanness is something that we need to grab a hold of today, uh, especially in this world uh, where pornography is rampant. Uh, it is in, on every single phone. It is on every single computer. It is in every home. And, and we need to just admit that. Stop trying to argue against it. It's a fact. It is everywhere. Uh, we see it in just in even television commercials. We see it, I'm telling you, when we were up in a clavic, only back in 2020, we saw commercials up there in the socialist media up there that just astounded us. And we had to turn the television off because it was just so vile. And now we're doing that in America two years later, three years later. Okay? Um, the uncleanness that has taken America is just absolutely putrid. And what we need to begin looking at in our own lives is things that, that vex us, those uh, we, we would uh, term the, the phrase habitual sins, all right, those sins that so easily beset us. We need to start looking at that for what it is, and it's uncleanness. You are unclean, okay? What I started out with is showing that you can be clean, that there is a cleansing in the Word of God. There is a cleansing flood in the blood of Jesus Christ, and we're going to look at some of that. But what does it mean to be unclean? What is uncleanness? There are unclean spirits throughout the entirety of the New Testament. Unclean spirits spoken of. Uh, in one verse, I believe we're going to look at it, connects them with devils. Okay, And when you look in the Old Testament, there's a, a few verses that connect devils with gods, lowercase g, gods. Okay, And that's why I, I stand and I proclaim it absolutely, that with absolute assurance, abortion is worship to Molech. Absolutely. Molech is that god of the Old Testament wherein they, they burn babies and sacrifice babies to that. And abortion today is still worshiping that same god. And we need to address it as such. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. Leviticus chapter 5 and verse 3. It says, Or if he touch the uncleanness of a man, whatsoever uncleanness it be that a man shall touch, that, that uh, be that a man shall be defiled withal, and it be hid from him, when he knoweth of it, then he shall be guilty. What we have here, I understand we are not under the Levitical system. However, if you throw out the Old Testament just because we are under grace, you are missing two-thirds of the Bible, and you are missing the entirety of the volume of the book wherein it is written of Jesus Christ. 
The entirety book of the book of Leviticus pictures Jesus Christ in one way or another. And if you have eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to understand, and God inspires that understanding in you, then you can too see Jesus Christ through the entirety of this book. Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written to me, to do thy will, O God. And now when we see this thing of uncleanness, uncleanness is something that is foreign that has made you spotted. Okay? Think of this. In the springtime, really yesterday morning before we got all the snow, this parking lot out here was covered in mud. Okay? Now, if I were to put on my white shirt and my nice black pants and my good dress shoes, and I were to go and I were to wrestle with my son Russell on the ground, would we stay clean? No. Not at all. If you go walking through a pasture and there's a herd of cows in there, if you do not walk circumspectly, what happens? You become unclean. Now, if, if you are working with your hands, and I know some of you are, are mechanics, and you work with cars, and you work with, with that type of thing, and, and your hands are permanently stained, if you have those permanently stained hands, raise them up. All right? Zane? I know you washed your hands this morning. I know you did, but they're dirty. Those are working hands. That's something to be honored. But when you are done working, you clean your hands. If not, it will make you sick. And it's the same thing in our own lives, and this is where we spiritualize this thing. Listen, if you are out in this world and you are allowing uncleanness in your eyes and you are allowing uncleanness in your ears and you are allowing uncleanness into the secret parts of your heart and you are allowing uncleanness in your home, you will be unclean. And that uncleanness brings with it unclean spirits. Those unclean spirits will manifest themselves many ways. And it's about time we start seeing this world that we're living in, not through carnal eyes, but through the eyes of the Bible, and see that those unclean spirits still vex men today. The iniquity that you are dealing with in your life, and again, iniquity is lawlessness. The basic understanding is it's lawlessness, but when you, when you really dig down into it, it's lawlessness in your heart. You don't care if there's a law of man. You don't care if there's a law of God. Uh, you would lump this into those presumptuous sins. You know it's wrong, but you're going to do it anyway. That's uncleanness. You're unclean before a holy God. And then you think you can stand in a pulpit and preach? Then you think you can stand and intercede for your family as the priest in your home? You think you can stand and proclaim the word of God and share that Jesus Christ saves sinners and completely changes lives? When you stand there in your uncleanness, having never been changed. It says that if it be hid from him when he knoweth it, then shall he be guilty. Ignorance is no excuse with God. You cannot hide behind this excuse of ignorance. Well, I just didn't know it was uncleanness. Well, guess what? Now you know. And you're guilty. All through the, uh, chapter 4, chapter 5 of Leviticus, what you see is these sins of ignorance. And the different people, if it's, if it's the priest that's anointed, or if it's the people, or if it's the rulers, or, or the common man, whatever. When that thing is known, you do it ignorantly. You didn't know. But when you know it, action is required. Action is required because you are now unclean. And in his mercy, the great God of heaven showed you that this morning. He didn't have to. He is not required to show you mercy. It's in his character to show the mercy into those who will repent. But he's not required to show you mercy. Now, let's go to Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10 and verse 8 says this. The Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee. When you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, and that ye may put difference between, unholy, or between holy and unholy, and between unclean and clean that ye may teach the children of Israel all the statutes of the Lord has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. The priests were not to drink wine nor strong drink. Why? Well, for one thing, if they did and they went into the tabernacle, they would die. They would be struck dead. 
Another thing, the main purpose was, I mean, that was just to keep them alive. But the main purpose was so that they would have discernment between holy and unholy, between clean and unclean, to be able to tell the difference. And what we are in America and in this country right now, in this town, in this church, we are a people who are so sodden with uncleanness and drunken with our own lust and our own pride that we cannot see the difference between holy and unholy, between clean and unclean, and we excuse our sin away. We excuse away that, that iniquity. Either that or our thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or excusing one another, making excuses for the things that you do, making excuses for the uncleanness in your life, rather than, and it might be that iniquity in, in uh, Exodus 20, verse 5, okay? Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of them that hate me, the third and fourth generation. I mixed the words up there a little bit, but that's what it's saying. The third and fourth generation... Visiting that iniquity, all right? So that would be me, the first generation, my father, the second, my grandfather, the third, my great-grandfather, the fourth. There are things that my great-grandfather had that were iniquity in his life that vex me today. They visit me. It doesn't mean that it's an abiding presence, but there are things that will come, and they go, and they come, and they go. And what you'll see, and you pastors here know this, you look at the families in your towns, respectively, the ones that God has emplaced in your trust, and you see certain families, and you can see that iniquity passed generation to generation to generation to generation. The greatest part about that is, though, is that verse 6. It says, but showing mercy unto thousands. That's thousands of individuals of them that love me and keep my commandments. Jesus said, buy the truth and sell it not. That's what it means to keep. You find that truth and you don't get rid of it. That's yours. That's a part of you. That's who you are. And when you make his commandments, his commandments aren't grievous to the child of God. You find a commandment in the word of God and you see that your life doesn't match up with that. You bless his holy name and say, praise the great God of heaven that he showed that iniquity in my life. Oh God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When you see that word cleanse, it's often associated with, with uncleanness. To cleanse is to make clean. So that means he takes that uncleanness and he makes you clean, which means that unrighteousness is uncleanness. And that opens up a whole new study. You go ahead and you go home in your Bibles. If you've got a good concordance, if you've got a Bible app software, you look up the word unrighteousness. And you see what uncleanness is. Everywhere that word is used. God makes that connection in 1 John 1, 9. Now, let's go to uh, chapter 13. We're going to look at, at uncleanness in a, in a little bit different light. And then we're going to apply it to the home. Chapter 13, verse 43. This is dealing with the plague of leprosy. Okay, chapter 13 and 14. 13 deals with a man be, being declared unclean. Chapter 14 declares a man being clean. What to do in that case, okay? And in that instance, that's where you get into, into Romans chapter 12. That's what Paul is talking about in verse 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Well, what living sacrifice were there? There was only two. There was the scapegoat, but the scapegoat had the sins of the nation placed on it, and it was driven off or taken off, led by a fit man into the wilderness. That picture is Jesus Christ. That's not us. We don't, we don't bear that in, as a living sacrifice. The only other living sacrifice you see is when a leper is declared un, unclean and then clean. It's that dove that is killed, and then another dove is taken and dipped in the blood of the, living, of the, of the slain bird, and then it's released. That living sacrifice went to the altar, was covered in blood, and then was released. And what that shows us is that everywhere a person would see a dove or a bird, a pigeon, covered in blood, they knew a leper had been declared clean. You see the picture? 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It is just your reasonable service, born-again believer, that you would bear the blood of Jesus Christ in this lost world. That when people look at you, they can clearly see by the blood of Jesus Christ on you and what it manifests in your life, that you are a leper that has been declared clean. But if you can only produce that for an hour or two during church and the rest of your life is sin sodden, I would tremble before a holy God and beg for his mercy. I was there for seven years lost, thinking I was born of God. Talking with a few of you in here, that's your testimony. A few of you in here, God has awakened you to your lost condition. I'd say in this small area, Per capita, we are having a great awakening. Because that's what the first great awakening was. It was a bunch of church people being awoken to their lost condition and trembling before a holy God. And God brought revival because of it. Now, but in Leviticus chapter 13, uh, you look at verse 30 or 43. Leviticus 13, 43. Then the priest shall look upon it, and behold, if the rising of the sore be uh, white, reddish in his bald head, or in his bald forehead, as the leprosy appeareth in the skin of the flesh. He is a leprous man. He is unclean. It's a plague. It is a plague. You look at that thing when that woman went to Jesus, had that issue of blood for 12 years. She went to Jesus with her issue. And when Jesus healed her, he said, you are healed of your plague. The problem was, was that woman was taking her issues to the physicians and she was only made the worse, wasted her entire living, her life on it. And she was only made the worse until she went to Jesus, who was the only hope she had. And she took her issue to him and Jesus showed her it was a plague. She was unclean. By the way, that issue of blood made that woman unclean. And this here. Verse 44, he is a leprous man, he is unclean. The priest shall pronounce him utterly unclean. His plague is in his head. And the leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent, and his head bare, and it shall put on a covering upon his upper lip, and shall cry, unclean, unclean. The problem is today that uncleanness is no longer crying unclean where you cover your head and where you're ashamed and where you hide in it. It is marched in the streets and proclaimed, I am unclean. Glory to God, I am unclean. And we parade it around. Now, this isn't just getting a bunch of like-minded people and preaching to you the loudness of these uh, dirty years that we are living in, these dark days. This is, I hopefully am, am praying that this is an inward introspection into your own heart. What uncleanness lives there. You know, Paul tells the Corinthian church that when preaching is going on, he uses the word prophesying. It's the proclaiming of the word of God. When the word of God is being proclaimed, and thus saith the Lord, if all prophesy, he says, and one come in who is unlearned or uh, unbelieving, says he is convinced of all, he is judged of all, which is missing in preaching today, and he will fall down in his face, and he will worship and he will say, God is in you of a truth. It says, thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. That's the purpose of preaching. It's to manifest the secrets in your heart. Those corners of your heart that you don't want to look at because it's too filthy, it's too dark, you know it's there. You think if you can ignore it long enough, it'll just go away. The Holy Ghost of God wants to put his finger on that thing and show you, you are unclean. And it's destroying you, it's destroying your family, it's destroying your church, it's destroying your town, it's destroying your country. And he will show mercy unto thousands of them that love him and keep his commandments. But you can't keep his commandments and be unclean. By very nature, uncleanness is you not keeping his commandments. So where does that leave us? That leaves us as lepers, unclean before a holy God, declared Walking about, crying, unclean, unclean. Verse 46 says, In all the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled. He is unclean. He shall, well, he shall dwell alone. Without the camp shall his habitation be. 
You're, un, you're defiled. Your mind is defiled because of the filth you look at. Your heart is defiled because of the meditations of the things you meditate on. The imaginations of your heart. Every single place you look at imaginations when it's connected with any part of you. In this King James Bible, it is always connected with your heart, never your mind. Your imaginations are in your heart. And your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? Jesus Christ knows it. Those people that were before him were saying things in their heart and he answered them. God alone searches the hearts. Jesus Christ is searching your heart this morning to show you that uncleanness, to show you your defilement before him and to show you that righteous wrath and judgment against it. You're defiled. You're separate. You're driven out of the camp. You don't have your dwelling place in the house of God. It's because you're unclean. Let's go to Leviticus 14. Leviticus 14 and verse 33. We're going to read all the way down to verse 45. This is dealing with leprosy in a home. Did you know that there could be leprosy in a house? Absolutely. Your house can be unclean. And I'm going to let the Lord apply that how it needs to be applied. We're just going to read the scriptures. What saith the scripture? Verse 33, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, When ye be come into the land of Canaan, which I give uh, to you for a possession, and I put the plague of leprosy in a house of the land of your possession. Now, who put it there? God put it there. Why do you think God would put leprosy in a home? I needed to see that I was a leper because I thought I was clean. God manifested things in my flesh that showed me the inner parts of my heart. By that, I was found guilty before a holy God. Bless his holy name for his wonderful works among the children of men. And he that owneth the house shall come and tell the priest, saying, It seemeth to me there is, there is as it were, a plague, of lep- a plague in the house. Then the priest shall command that they empty the house before the priest go in, uh, into it to see the plague, that all that is in the house be not made unclean. And afterward, the priest shall go in and see the house. He shall look on the plague, and behold, the plague be in the walls of the house with hollow strakes, greenish or reddish, which in sight are lower than the wall. Then the priest shall go out of the house to the door of the house and shall shut up the house seven days. The priest shall come again the seventh day and shall look, and behold, if the plague be spread in the walls of the house, then the priest shall command that they take away the stones in which the plague is. And they shall cast them into an unclean place without the city. And he shall cause the house to be scraped within round about. And they shall pour out the dust that they scrape off without the city and into, unto an unclean place. And they shall take the other stones and put them in the place of those stones. And he shall take the other mortar, other mortar and shall plaster the house. If the plague come again and break out in the house. Well, that sounds like untempered mortar to me. After that, he hath taken away the stones, and after he hath scraped the house, and plagued after, and, and after it's plastered, then the priest shall come and look, and behold, if the plague be spread in the house, it is a fretting leprosy in the house, it is unclean, and he shall break down the house. And Jesus said something to this effect, if your eye offend you, cut it out. If your hand offend you, cut it off. It'd be better for you to enter into life maimed than to go whole into hellfire. What kind of uncleanness are you allowing in your house, men? Boys. What kind of uncleanness? What kind of leprosy are you bringing into your home? That your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren, and your great-great-grandchildren will be vexed by if the Lord is merciful enough to tarry long enough. What kind of uncleanness? He says here, you you scrape it out and you get rid of it. There were some that was deep in the wall. Those stones had to be completely removed and put new in its place. But if it came back, you know what they did? They destroyed the place. 
Some of you have some things in your homes that need to just be destroyed and gotten rid of. Let God take that where it will. Go to Haggai chapter 2. Haggai is just before the book of Zechariah. Zechariah is just before Malachi. Malachi is just before Matthew. Help you find Haggai chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2 verse 14 says this. Then answered Haggai and said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, saith the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, that which they offer there is unclean. I pray you now consider from this day and upward, from before a stone was laid upon a stone in the temple of the Lord, since those days were when one came, upon, came to an heap of twenty measures, there were but ten. When one came to the, uh, the press pat for to draw out fifty vessels out of the press, There were but 20. I smote you with a blasting and with mildew and with hail and in all the labors of your hand. Yet ye turned not to me, saith the Lord. And you see, that is why he put leprosy in that home. You see it right there. So that they would turn unto him. So that they would turn to him and they would repent. He says, you didn't return. You didn't turn to me. You didn't turn to me. I want you to go to Exodus chapter 34 now. Exodus 34, we're going to see something that the nation of Israel swore they would do, but didn't. And the word of God came true. Exodus 34 and verse 10. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people will I do marvels. Such have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord. For it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Observe thou that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite, and the Canaanite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Take heed to thyself. Now, here's something interesting. That is a singular pronoun. Thyself. He's talking to individuals here. He's not talking to the entire nation of Israel. He's speaking to them, but he's speaking to a nation of individuals. This is individual responsibility. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest. Look at this. Lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But you shall destroy their altars, Break their images and cut down their groves, for thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice. Now take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a whoring after their gods. Thou shalt make thee no molten gods. He said, you go in there, don't make a lead with any of these people, you drive them out, I will drive them out, and take heed to thyself. Because if you don't, they will be a snare to you. Let's go to, uh, uh, yeah, Judges, (laughs) chapter 1. Joshua, Judges, chapter 1. We start right at verse 19. It says, And the Lord was with Judah, and he drave out the inhabitants of the mountain, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. That's an interesting thing. Just because they had chariots of iron, Judah couldn't drive them out, even though God said that he would. And they gave Hebron to Caleb, and Moses said, And he expelled thence thee, the sons of Anak. And the children of Benjamin did not, did not, not, not could not, did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem until this day. In the house of Joseph, they also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. In the house of Joseph sent to decry Bethel, now the name of the city there there before was Luz. The spies saw a man come forth out of the city, and they said to him, Show us, we pray thee, the entrance to the city, and we will show thee mercy." And when he showed them the entrance to the city, they smote the city with the edge of the sword. But they let go the man and all his family. And the man went into the land of the Hivites and built a city 
and called the name thereof Luz, which is the name thereof this day. Look at verse 27. Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean and her towns, nor Taanach and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Ibelium and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo and her towns, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. And it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites to tribute and did not utterly drive them out, directly disobeying God. What did he say would happen if they dwelt in the land? It would be a snare to them. Neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites that dwell in Gezer, but the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. Neither did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitrin, nor the inhabitants of Nahol, but the Canaanites dwelt among them and became tributes. Neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Echo, nor the inhabitants of Zidon, nor of Elab, nor of Akzib, nor of Heba, or of Aphek, or of Rehob. But the Ashtarites dwelt among the Canaanites and the inhabitants of the city, for they did not drive them out. Neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Bishit. And you go down through, they didn't drive them out. 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 These ones were allowed to stay. These ones were allowed to stay. We made tribute. We made tribute. We made tribute. We made peace. It became a snare unto them. Those ones that God said, you utterly destroy them. You drive them out completely. Kill them all. They made league with them. It became a snare unto them. And it vexed them and is still vexing them today. Why would it surprise us that God's word came true? Some of you in here are born of God, but your homes are filthy and unclean. God has shown you time and time again, there's things in your homes, in your lives, that you need to drive out. But you've made league with them. You've found a peaceful way to cohabitate with that uncleanness. A way that you can moderate your uncleanness so that you can still have a fair show in the flesh of religiosity. But God said to drive it out. God said to get rid of it. God said that it needs to be driven out or it will be a snare to you. And you yourself know in your heart it still is unto this day. Let's go to Zechariah now. Chapter 13. We need some good news. Zechariah 13. I don't know how much time we have. I, what time do we usually end? We're going to end when the preaching's done. How's that sound, guys? Are we good with that? If you have to go, if you have a, an appointment or, or a, a meeting place you have to get to, call them and tell them you're staying for the preaching. <laughs> Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1. In that day, there shall be a fountain open to the house of David, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. Glory to God for that fountain. Oh, bless his holy name for that fountain. That fountain of blood, wherein sinners are plunged beneath that flood and they lose all their guilty stains. Oh, the blood of the everlasting covenant. When was the last time you actually shouted and praised the Lord for the blood of Jesus Christ? When was the last time it even crossed your mind? Maybe some of you this morning. Praise the Lord for it. But if not, do you know it's in your will to praise the Lord? But it's commanded of God that let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Saint and sinner alike. I don't care if you're sitting here lost today. I care for your soul. But in relation to this, you're required to praise the Lord. If you're a saint of God... You're required to praise the Lord. You say, how can, a, how can a sinner praise the Lord? He can praise the Lord that he sent Jesus Christ to die for his sins and that he has shown him mercy and long-suffering for another day that he would seek the Lord, if happily they might seek after him and feel for him and find him. If any man come to God, he must first believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So sinner today, you have a responsibility before the God of heaven to bless his holy name that he gave you another chance to diligently seek for him. Because you might not have tomorrow. This may be the last chance you get. But how diligently have you been seeking him? Thou knowest. 
that fountain is now opened for sin and for uncleanness. Verse 2, and it shall come to pass that in that day that the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land. Praise God! What did he say he would do? Those names of those idols are those ones that inhabited the land that vexed them and were a snare unto them. He said, I'm going to cut them off. You know what day that was? It's when that fountain was made available. You realize it's only a vexation and a snare to you because you allow it to be. All who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That points to your own personal will, your decision. You make that decision. You're either going to live godly in Christ Jesus or you're going to live after the flesh. If you're born of God, you're no longer in the flesh. You're just deciding to rebel against a holy God and to live after the flesh. Your carnal mind, which is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, it's enmity with God, you are following that thing to destruction. And if you truly are a child of God, and you are continually living after the flesh, God will kill you. He's not going to allow that to go on. What kind of a just God would that be? So let's consider this. I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. I will also cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. Unclean spirit. Let's go to, let's go to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Verse 33. something very disturbing about this account and that the people recognized that there was an unclean spirit in the house of God and it didn't trouble them. Verse 33, in the synagogue, there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice saying, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Thou art thou come to destroy us? And this is the devil that was in this man, this unclean spirit Proclaiming, I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. You realize the Holy One that you see through the entirety of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ. You see the Holy One in the entirety of the New Testament is Jesus Christ. Friends, your Bible's perfect. God designed this thing so that you could believe it and so you could trust it. And when you trust it and you stand alone on these words... In belief. Sorry, could you say that again? No, I won't. <laughs> when you do that, he'll reveal things to you. May I ask you this? When was the last time flesh and blood revealed something to you? I'm not saying it's bad that flesh and blood reveals something to you. I sat under preaching for years and years and years and years. And flesh and blood continually revealed things to me. It was things that I knew. I knew them. I had a knowledge of this stuff, but I didn't believe it. Until God in his mercy began revealing things to me from his word. If you're born again here today, God at least once has revealed himself to you in the person of Jesus Christ. When Jesus asked Peter, well, who, do, who do you say that I am? Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this to thee, but my Father which is in heaven. When was the last time God the Father revealed anything to you? Do you even know what it would be like? Would you recognize it? The difference when he inspires understanding. I've used that term twice, I'll explain it. Job 32, 8, there's a spirit in man and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth him understanding. It's one of only two places in your Bible that the word inspiration is used. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The man of God may be perfect, throughly furnished unto all good works. And then there in Job 32, 8. 
There's a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Inspiration is breathing in. It's not breathing out. That's expiration. That's expiring. Okay? When a person dies, they breathe out their last breath, and they expire. Okay? When you breathe in, you're inspiring. So where does the God of all heaven have to be in order to inspire understanding? Inside. And so, when was the last time that happened? Now let's look at this. Verse 35, And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and heard him not. And look at this, And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they come out. They weren't amazed that there was an unclean spirit in their presence. They knew it was there. But just the very fact that with just his word, that unclean spirit came out. Do you realize the uncleanness in your life is because of unclean spirits? There, there is an idea today that we need to stay away from the idea of spirits in this world and, and all of this. And I really don't know where it comes from. It certainly doesn't come from your Bible. But there are unclean spirits in our homes. There are unclean spirits among the people who come and visit your church. There are unclean spirits amongst those who walk in this world today. And they vex, and they hound you, and they bring in all sorts of filthy imaginations into your heart. And these unclean spirits, Jesus Christ, can vanquish. He can cast them out. We saw it in Zechariah. We see it in Luke. Turn to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Verse 43 says this. <clears throat> when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he came out, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he and take with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be unto this Wicked generation. You may get rid of an unclean spirit, but if you don't fill your home, if you go wandering in dry places and you try finding peace outside of Jesus Christ, you're going to go back to that home. Boy, it's going to be perfectly garnished and fit and ready for you, almost like that home that had leprosy and they shut it up for seven days. And they go back and find it in a perfect state and then they settle in. And those seven evil spirits come back with the man who was just wandering about, mind wandering about, no concern for the word of God, no concern for the law of God, no concern for the God of heaven at all. His latter state is worse than the first. So it's not enough to just get rid of the uncleanness in your life. What are you going to replace it with? Are you going to be the one that gets rid of that unclean spirit? Or does God have to do it? There are some things that come not but by fasting and prayer. As uh, Brother Dale Morey has said just recently, fasting, to fast, F-A-S-T, that is a four-letter F word in the church today. Nobody wants to do it. Why? Because it's too spiritual? It's too beyond the norm? I didn't have a fasting class in college. I don't know, did, are there classes that teach on fasting? Yeah, it's been 30 years since I went to college. Okay. It's been three. I went to the backside of the Desert University, the Klavik Northwest Territories, Canada. All right. Let's look at this uncleanness. We're almost done here, I promise. This was, this was my introduction. Now we're getting to the preaching. I, I joke. All right, Romans chapter 1. I'm just going to read some scriptures and let it fall where it lay. Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like, unto corrupt, made like to corruptible man, and to birds and, birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. By the way, that's an image. That's a single image. 
that has those four heads. That's a cherubim. That's that anointed cherub. That's Satan. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections, even for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. It's exactly what they deserved. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness. Oh, look at that. Fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy. And there's a difference between envy and jealousy. God's name is jealous. We read that just a little bit ago. Murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, Inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable. It means I can't ever be satisfied. Never satisfied. One key word that you find on a lot of social media today is, oh, that's satisfying. ASMR. Anybody know that tag? All right. It, it, it satisfies the natural senses. All right. It's, it's really quiet whispering and noises that that satisfy the, the, sen the senses, okay? And everyone's looking for satisfaction. Uh, Brother Becker, who's now in New Zealand, on his missionary presentation video, he, he put in there that everyone is looking for peace, but they're settling for pleasure. They're looking to be satisfied. Just as you won't find salvation in seeking salvation... The only salvation you will ever find is in seeking Jesus Christ. When you find the person of Jesus Christ, you will find salvation. You'll find that home in heaven. You'll find that that condemnation is gone. You find that you no longer have to worry about the condemnation of hell. You find all of these things. You find a new creature in you. You find all of that. But that is icing on top of the cake that is Jesus Christ. That's why we seek him and him alone. By the way, that seeking doesn't stop once you've found him. Because then you want to know him. Oh, that I may know him. The power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his sufferings. Nobody likes to quote the last part of that verse. You know, Leonard Ravenhill once said, uh, he would quite often have in his later years, he would have young men come to him. And uh, he was a, for those of you who might not know Leonard Ravenhill, he was a very... Uh, prolific preacher, don't agree with everything he said. I don't agree with everything I say, so there's that. But, <clears throat> but he would have some young preachers come to him, and they would want him to pray over them and, and pass on his mantle, so to speak. And he would say in his, in his British, old British voice that he say, he says, they're, they're always wanted to come to get my mantle, but they don't want my sackcloth and ashes. Again, nobody wants to fast. Nobody wants to hurt. Oh, we desire to see, you know, revival in our land, and we desire to see our loved ones saved, and we desire to see our church people growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we're not willing to hurt ourselves for it. <laughs> we're not even willing to fast at a men's prayer breakfast. I mean, how many of you would have been disappointed if you got here and I said, no, we're fasting so that we can pray? It's just things that rattle through my brain. All right. But God gave them up to this stuff. God gave them up to that. That's where America's at. Collectively, as a nation, the heart of America has been given over to a reprobate mind to work those things which are unseemly. He did it using the Supreme Court, and it's just accelerating. Now, all of this wickedness is freedoms that they have, and you can't take freedoms away in America. <laughs> You saw what happened when they reversed Roe versus Wade, the upcry from that. Evil men and seducers are going to wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. It's not going to get better. What are you going to do in these last days, though? Because you no longer have the excuse of ignorance. You know you're unclean. 
Praise God if God didn't show you anything this morning. That you're able to lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Your hands are clean before a holy God. And you can praise and bless his holy name knowing there's no uncleanness in your heart. Oh, but what if? What if you didn't have ears to hear? What if your heart was not prepared? What if you're on that wayside, hard-packed ground? The seed fell on four different types of hearts this morning. Let's look at Romans 6. Just got just got a couple more here. I, want, I really want to look at this thing. Romans 6, look at 18. Being then made free from sin, glory to God for that. Ye became the servants of righteousness. Glory to God for that. I'm a servant to righteousness. Those things which I used to do, I don't want to do them anymore. And God has given me the ability and the liberty to stand in the truth that I can do everything that I want to do because he's changed the things that I want to do. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What a terrible thought. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin, you become servants to God, and ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Now, go to Galatians 5. We need to look at this, this whole list here, these works of the flesh. Uh, Brother McVeigh preached this up in uh, Black Creek. He had a prophecy conference, and he, he preached about the prophecy in uh, Galatians 5. And you know what God showed me that night? I'm going to be open and honest with you. I was guilty of every single one of those things in this list. This was all me. I couldn't hide from a single one. God showed me every single one. And then he brought that blessed scripture, and such were some of you. Well, glory! Come on, I... I know we're in the north. We're quiet up here. I get it. I'm okay with that. But sometimes you just got to shout because the Bible said to. Amen. Amen. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery. Guilty. Fornication. Guilty. Uncleanness. Very guilty. Lasciviousness. I'm not even going to put very on it because they're all extremely guilty lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Guilty. That was me. The entire gamut. I can't hide from a single one. Bless God if you can. But I couldn't. Of the which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. In that list is uncleanness. Ephesians 4 talks about working uncleanness with greediness. Uh, Ephesians 5 talks that, there's, there's, that no unclean person hath any inheritance with God. Colossians 3 tells us that we need to mortify our members. That means put it to death. That means if your hand offends you, cut it off. It'd be better for you to go through life without a hand than to have that thing be that thing which continually brings you to uncleanness. It would be better that you were born blind, having never been able to put one eye on pornography, than to have that thing be a vexation to you and drag you into the pit of hell because your heart is so clouded and your mind is so clouded and filthy and unclean that you cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except, a man can't come to God except he draw him. You say, well, how do I know if God is drawing me? Well, you're here this morning, aren't you? There is some reason, way deep down in, go back into the annals of time, and everything that brought everything to a culmination of this morning today, there is something that the God of heaven knew you needed to hear out of his blessed word 
that brought you to listen to a shouting little young 37-year-old kid who never went to Bible college and doesn't know anything. I'm ignorant and unlearned. The only thing that I know is that I love this Bible, and I love the God of this Bible. And when I get in and I get alone with him, oh, he shows me himself. So why did God bring you here? Go to, go to 2 Peter, please, if you would. If you, can, if you can withstand for a little while longer. Watch and pray. 2 Peter 2, 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of punishment to be punished, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness. These are the ones he reserves to the day of judgment to be punished. Chiefly them that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. You say, well, what does that mean? Let's go, Brandon. If you know what that means, that applies to that. Calling our, the president of the United States of America a sleepy Joe. Whining and complaining about Camilla Harris, our vice president. Not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Why does a child of God say these things? It's uncleanness. You've got uncleanness in your heart. Some of you here today, you know you're lost. This stuff is in your heart, and God's revealing it to you to show you why you don't believe him. Why you don't believe his word. Because you're unclean. And it shows you here what a just and a holy God will do to those who do not believe. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and we're done. Now, this is an entire hour and a half long sermon just on 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So I'm going to give you the abridged version. We all know this verse. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. There are four lies from Satan in this verse. Four lies. I know there's four lies because God answers to four lies in this verse. Verse 13 the very first part of that, the first lie of Satan is you're the only one that is tempted with this thing. You're absolutely alone in this. God answers that by saying, there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. You're not alone. You're tempted with it, so is your pastor. You're tempted with it, so is your brother. So is your neighbor. So is your father. So is your sister. So is your wife. No temptation taking you, but such is common to man. Now we could dig into that whole thing of being taken, Okay, What happens when somebody takes you? They've taken you captive. That temptation that takes you, takes you captive. Second thing, but God is faithful. God is faithful. Satan's lying to you in thinking that God has abandoned you. God's left you to this thing. It continually vexes you. He's just, he just gives you over to this continually. The Bible says he gives us over to certain things. If we refuse his word, if we refuse his will, and our heart is rejecting what he is showing us, and we refuse in our pride, and we refuse in our arrogance, yeah, he's going to give you over to that thing. And it'll hurt. You'll come back with scars, and your pet and sackcloth and ashes, and 1 John 1, 9, is still in the book. But it's going to hurt, and there's going to be damage. And some you'll take to your grave with you. I guarantee you that man that went off into the far country and ended up wasting his whole living, and ended up living with the pigs, he came back with some scars. Scars. Some things may be wounds that never healed. Uncleanness. But God is faithful. He answers that. God is faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful. Can I get an amen at least once? Thank you. God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able... There's no way you can resist this temptation. It's too strong. Look at every time it's taken you. Here it is again, coming back. By the way, that thing, that unclean spirit that continually comes and that uncleanness that comes, you know what that is? 
The Bible calls that a familiar spirit. You recognize that thing. It knows you. And it loves to vex you. He has specific command to vex you in this thing daily. It's that familiar spirit. And there are some that play around with these familiar spirits. There are some that play around with it. And that's death. That's death to you. The carnal mind is enmity with God. And those familiar spirits play around in your carnal mind. They plant imaginations from your heart into your mind. It's going to come out as that sinful action every time. But God's answer to that is that he will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able with his help. You try to do it on your own, you can't. And I, I, we're, about to, we're about to look at something else here that is key, absolutely pivotal to this thing. And he says, but will with the temptation make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Satan's fourth lie, there's no way out. You cannot bear this. Just give in. Just quit. There's no way out. God says he's already made a way to escape. That you may be able to bear it. Now, bearing that thing might be fleeing from it. But you can't always run. So what do you do? You fight it off. You fight it off. There's something very important about that way to escape. And I liken it to a highway exit. I will openly admit, I didn't originate this. A lot of my stuff, I, I, these examples and such, my brain just doesn't work that way. Okay? But this is the best way I've heard it explained, ever. It was a highway. Let's just say you're driving down Route 86, and you know the highway number to get off into Olean. I don't even know what that highway number is. Okay? Does anybody know what that one is? Brings you out right down by the hospital. 24. 24, okay. You're driving down the highway, and you know exit 24 is coming. It's still a mile and a half down the road. You know it's there. Can you take it right then? 26, is it? 26, all right. You were getting off the wrong exit. Yeah. Back roads and stuff, all right. But you're a mile and a half from that exit, and you see the sign that says, exit 26, one and a half miles. Can you take that exit right then? You can. You're going to end up in the ditch. Okay? You can't. What about when it's a mile down the road? Can you take that exit then? No. If you're going, let's just say you're going 60 miles an hour for the simplicity of my simple brain. 60 miles an hour. You have one mile to go. That means you'll get there in one minute. Okay? When you get there and you're a half a mile from that thing, you still have 30 seconds before you get to the exit. Can you start turning then? We can get in the right lane. But you can't turn yet. But then you get closer and closer and closer, and you're a quarter of a mile away. That's, what, 15 seconds. You still can't turn off because it's still up there. You can see the exit. You know right where it's at. You may be getting to slow down. Do you know how long you actually have to take that exit? Four seconds. You have four seconds. From the time when that road starts to widen out, so the time where it's passed, you've got about four seconds to take exit 26, or you miss it, and you're down the road. You have four seconds to take that way of escape. Four seconds. Let me liken it to something, something that some people in here will understand. You're sitting there scrolling on your social media. You know exactly where to go on that thing to find pornography. You know. You know those well-beaten paths. You know how to make provision for your flesh to get here and go there and look at that and turn there and accidentally click over on this and then scroll down here. And... Guilty. I know how to get there. I've been vexed by it. I've been addicted to it. But you've got four seconds. When the Spirit of God comes to you and knocks on your heart and says, hey, what are you doing? You have four seconds to get away from that thing. You go to that next part, to the next part, to the next part. A minute and a half later, the exit is a mile and a half down the road. You've already passed it. You've missed it. 
And that's why it seems hopeless. You have four seconds. What are you going to do with it? Meanwhile, driving down the road, aimlessly, mindless wandering, you know, 86. That was 417 years ago. I, I don't know if 417 is still that bad or not, but boy, it was really bad. Going from Woodhall to Addison and, you know, all the way, all the way down like that. But driving down the road and, and you're, you're, you're driving and you're seeing the road and, oh, yep, there's Olean, okay. And all of a sudden, oh, exit 26. There's some times when you will be mindlessly going about your day. Just normal day. And that familiar spirit comes back. You've got less than four seconds to get off that exit. And it has to be drastic. You've got to slam on the brakes. You've got to jerk that wheel over. You've got to wake your wife up. She's going to yell at you. I mean, the whole nine yards. Been there. <laughs> okay. But you've got four seconds. If you don't take anything else out of this here today, you're unclean, you need to be clean, you got four seconds to get out of temptation. That's it. Now we're done. I, I've got, you know, no, no, you know what, we're not done. I got some scripture. I thought ahead because I figured it was going to go along, so I actually typed out the rest of the verses so we ain't going to turn to them. Now you just listen. Just listen for a second here. Are we ready? Are we okay? Are we still doing okay? Amen. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the what? unclean thing. You ever make that connection? And I will receive you. That's in God's will to receive you. If. If you come out from among them and you be separate and you touch not the unclean thing, he says, I will receive you. And will be unto you a, fa a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. We look at it as a fleshly thing, but it is a spiritual battle. These unclean spirits are vexing your spirit, and you need to stop looking at it as just a habit in your flesh. It is a spiritual battle that you are dealing with. And you need to start looking at it for what it is. It's unclean. There are men who are unclean in this room today. There are men in this room, no doubt, that have looked at pornography this morning. That's just the statistics of this world today. You're unclean. You need to be clean. Let's look at this. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. How do you get clean? You find the fear of God. Where do you find the fear of God? You look at his righteous judgments against uncleanness in this book. Fishing lessons, guys. That's all it is. Ephesians 5, 26 and 27. That he may sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the what? The word. That's what he does. The washing of water by the word. My word which I have spoken unto you, you're clean by it, he said. Uh, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. A spot is a foreign substance. A wrinkle gets on clothes because you put it away wrong. You've neglected it. Uh, any such things like that. A blemish is something that you're born with. And God wants to present you to himself a glorious church. Clean. James 4, 8 through 10, draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. And again, in that King James Bible helps, nigh does not mean near. Near is proximity, okay? In relation to counter sport, we are near to shingle house, okay? But if I were to bring my wife in here and I were to hold her, 
I would be nigh unto her. There's nothing between me and her. Nothing. That's a difference. You draw nigh unto God, that's you making that initial move. What does that mean? There's stuff in the way that you know is in the way. Move it out of the way. And what does God say he'll do? He'll draw nigh unto you. That means he sees stuff that's in the way that you can't see or can't move. And he'll take care of that. (coughs) Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. That's your job. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. That's your job. How do you do that? With the washing of water by the word. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Another place where it says to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Under his hand, in the sight of the Lord. And then 1 John 1, 8, 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, the fruit of our sin nature, okay? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. That's where we're going to close. We're just going to let the Lord take that, do with it what he will. Do any of our men of God in here have an exhortation for us and close in prayer? Closing exhortation in prayer. Good. That heaviness is good. Father, thank you for this time we've had. Oh God, I pray that you prepare our hearts to meet with you in prayer. Lord God, I do pray that you would take these things that were said, and Lord, that you would use them to search our hearts, to try our reins, and to give it to every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Lord, may we seek the Lord Jesus Christ this day and be merciful on us, and we thank you for that mercy and your grace. We thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. It's by the name that is above every name, that holy name of Jesus Christ that I pray. Amen.